My light sisters, as usual, you're welcome to come up. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Supposedly, the Ummah Musafirin, yeah. The Kalam Bukulu. I got to raise the microphone. Testing, testing. Better? Can you all not hear me? No? Really? Okay, hold on. Let me turn on the microphone. Is that better? That's what it was. Welcome everybody to today's special session of Friday Night Lights on a, you know, alhamdulillah, we've been able to delve into the stories of some of the prophets over the past couple of months. And one that was on our radar that we wanted to discuss, obviously, was one of the great prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, and that is Nuh alayhi salam. And the story is familiar, I think, to almost everybody, the general arc of the story of Nuh alayhi salam. But sometimes we take the stories for granted, and we don't really take advantage of all of the gems and all of the lessons that are infused in these stories of these great prophets. And so that's what we want to do, inshallah ta'ala, today. We're just going to highlight a number of reflections from the story of Nuh, inshallah ta'ala, and maybe the familiar will be novel tonight, inshallah. That's the goal. We have with us, of course, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim and Sheikh Kamal. And alhamdulillah, we're just going to jump right into it, inshallah ta'ala. So, uh, Sheikh Kamal, I'll begin with you. I know that you taught a, a course on the story of the prophets, and, and yes. this is something that you've, you've interacted with for a long time now. What jumps out to your mind as far as the story of Nuh, alayhi salam? Um, so, the scholars say Nuh, alayhi salam, lived uh, the longest of all the scholars. Yani. It's a statement they make. They said that he lived longer than any other. Uh, sorry, did I say scholar? Longer, longer than any other prophet, right? So he spent 950 years calling his people to Islam or to believe to become believers. But the 950 years—that's his age in da'wah. That was not his total age. Some scholars said he began at age 50. Some scholars said he began to call them at age 100. And there's even a third opinion that says. He began at the age of 300. But the point is that for 950 years, he's calling them to Allah. So one thing that comes to mind immediately, and it's, and it's a great blessing, that we and the prophets as well and other nations are rewarded based on effort, not based on success. You know, you work, I would say if you work at a dealership, they pay you when you sell cars. They don't pay you just for talking to customers and, give, and, and you know, test drives and all that stuff. They pay you only when you produce or only when you sell. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards Nuh for the 950 years of calling people to Allah, not for the qalil, the handful that believed with him. So that's right off the bat, the first thing that I always think of when I remember the story of Nuh alayhi salam. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. There are so many uh, stations that I can, you know, uh, Stop by a Nuh story, but I will start with one. And uh, one of the contentions of his people on why they would not want to believe in his message is that they say the first people that uh, believed in you were the, the riffraff, in a way. You know, so, you know, this is the reason why we're not going to, you know, uh, follow you because it's the riffraff among us who 
followed you. And not only that, they believed in you right away. They didn't even think. They said, Badi al Ra'i. They didn't even think. As soon as uh, Nuh alayhi salam invited them to worship Allah alone, they submitted right away. They believed. And they took that as a, you know, a, a reason why not to believe in him. Because these were the elite, al mala the elite. And actually, they're actually in this, they're praising them for accepting the call of fitrah. That, you know, they, it didn't take them, you know, any time to think. And that is one thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised in them. That this is a praiseworthy quality that you did not hesitate to believe in Allah. You believed in Allah right away as soon as you heard the message. And that is, that reminds me of a statement that Allah, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, mentioned about Abu Bakr. He said, مَا دَعَوْتُ أَحَدًا إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ إِلَّا كَانَتْ لَهُ كَبْوَةٌ غَيْرُ أَبِي بَكْرٍ فَإِنَّهُ لَمْ يَتَلْعَثَمْ he says, I did not invite anyone to Islam except that they had to think about it. They took their time. They didn't believe right away, except Abu Bakr. He didn't hesitate. Mm. He believed right away. That's great. I used to always tell students, what was the story of Islam, uh, of the Islam of Abu Bakr? Everyone's quiet. Because like, there was no story. He just believed. Yeah, he became Muslim right yeah. away. As <laughs> soon as the Prophet invited him, didn't hesitate. Yeah. This notion of the mala the elite of the people of Nuh saying we only see that the people following you are the low amongst us, the, the losers, the have-nots, the riffraff, I think is really telling, profound, scary because we can't just distance ourselves from that attitude however thousands of years ago it was, but to question ourselves. How do I feel when I walk into a masjid and it's a blue-collar masjid, so to speak, a blue-collar community? Sometimes people belittle with it, with it. the people who... A leaking roof. Huh? With a leaking roof. Mm -hmm. With a leaking roof and all of that type of stuff. And the people are very simple and you go into a, you know, a community and it's farmers and, and things of that nature. Sometimes, and, and I think this plays out in many places in the Muslim world, where the elite of society look down at religiosity and they see religious people as being simple-minded. They look at religious people as being unintelligent. They look at religious people as being uneducated. This plays out a lot, right, Shif? Yeah, and you see it overseas even more so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like they're, you know, certain, I'm not going to mention, uh, but certain countries, they, they'll make fun of a specific group. And every do joke about a dumb person is a person from this region. Yeah. And then for this one place, I found out that the history behind that is that this region was always more mm -hmm. religious than everyone else. And because they were more religious, the rest regarded them as unintelligent due to that, mm. which is such a shame, you know. And this even plays out locally for us. Sometimes, and I tell, you know, young people this a lot. Sometimes you might go to university, sometimes you might be in high school, and the practicing Muslim kids are not necessarily the cool kids. They're not the jocks, they're not the guys getting a whole lot of attention, they, they don't have popularity, they might be, you know, unattractive in that sense. And so what are you supposed to do? Do you hang around with the non-cool kids who are religious or do you, maybe you have the ability to hang out with the cool kids? And we read in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah saying, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِ Allah says, endure the company of those who call yeah. upon their Lord in the morning and the evening. Sometimes you might have a, a Muslim kid in your school and you befriend him only because he's Muslim and personality-wise you might not even really enjoy their company that much. Mm -hmm. But you still stick to them because they believe yeah. in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One thing to add to that context, in that same conversation with Nuh alayhi salam, they indicated that these, you know, the lowly among us or the riffraff, they also are not really uh, didn't have the best behavior in a way. Mm. So Nuh alayhi salam's answer right away, he did not argue mm. their point. He didn't say, no, you're wrong. Didn't say... He didn't uh, defend them in that yeah, sense. Yeah, he didn't try to defend them, did not validate their claim either. He did not validate their claim. He didn't say that you're telling the truth. 
because it's really not significant to even speak about it. All he said, وَمَا عِلْمِي بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْعَلُونَ how, wh why should I know what they used to do? And that indicates sometimes you, in your, in your da'wah, when you invite people to Islam, you may, you may come across someone who didn't have the best history, let's say, but he's sincere in accepting your da'wah, his history should not, his past should not stop you from giving him da'wah. It doesn't matter what sin they, that is none of your business. And that's what uh, basically Nuh told them, that's not of my business. It's not of my business to go and dig their past. Yes. Their, their judgment is with Allah, not with me. I'm not going to judge them. Allah will judge them if you only knew. So you do your, what you're supposed to do. And don't worry about the others who accepted the faith. They may have uh, 100 tattoos on their bodies. It doesn't matter. Yeah. That should not be the, uh, something to stop you from you know, accepting them into the falls of Islam because of their past. It's a, I call it a very uh, pharaonic argument where it happens overseas where someone, Allah guides them, and then they come and, and, and tell, let's say, someone in the village, or, or don't do this, it's haram. Like, oh, now you're telling us haram? You forgot? You used to be the town drunk and you used to do this and yeah. get into fights. Now you're coming to tell us. And this is exactly what Fir'aun did. When Musa came to him, I'm a prophet of Allah, and he called him to Allah, he said, Alam fina walida, fina min umra wa fa'alta fa'alta fa'al. So he's like, we didn't we raise you here and you stayed for a couple of years with us and then you did that thing that you did, you know, kill the man accidentally. What does that have to do with anything? It has nothing to do with anything, but it, yeah. it's just... A very, and I always tell people, don't do it, it's a very nasty way. I wanted to just quickly go back to the thousand years thing, because uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَبِثَ فِي قَوْمِهِ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا خَمْسِينَ عَامًا So he stayed mm. in, right? So the, <laughs> the I don't scholar, know where you're going, but I like it. You like it already? Well, it may not be that impressive, but, but the scholar said, why did Allah say he stayed amongst his people for a thousand years, less 50, or save, or except for 50. Yani 950. Why didn't it just say 950? So they said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to feel the length, the long period of time that he stayed and endured with his people. So that number 1,000 is stronger, right? That's just yeah. like, you know, we know this in, in different ways. You, you go to the market and they tell you it's 999. Because it's not a hundred, right? That's just one cent away from a hundred. But it's that number, the way the number a hundred hits you is different than 99. And the way a thousand will hit you is different than 950. I think Sheikh Ammar wrote something on, on a post about this. Oh yeah? About the length and how, yeah. you know, the, the, the issue of being patient with the people. What, 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 do, you, what do you say? It's unbelievable. Nuh for 950 years is giving da'wah to people and he's not getting an audience. And that's really, really hard to do. That's really hard to do. I want you to imagine a family member who you tell to pray, you tell to not do stupid things, you tell them not to, you tell them to study, you tell them to focus, you tell them to, and they don't listen and they do the exact opposite of what you tell them all of the time. It becomes really hard to continue to engage this person. And even a lot of times when it comes to the topic of giving da'wah, we opt out to that which is easier. It is actually easier for me to sit in a masjid and give da'wah to you guys than it would be for me to give da'wah to my 14-year-old cousin who doesn't care about what I have to say. It would be, it would be harder. And so sometimes we might even opt out of, of when the ashiratik al akrabin giving da'wah to your family members, your kids, your and give da'wah to a, a more willing audience. And then even if the masjid sometimes is too difficult, you just go online and you just talk into a vacuum and you get likes and shares and hearts and all of that type of stuff and everybody loves you and it's easier. It's always easier to talk to those who are more willing to accept the message. It's easier to talk to adults than it is to teenagers a lot of mm -hmm. times. It's even easier. Like it's, it's How about non-Muslims versus Muslims? A lot of people find non-Muslims easier. No, lot, 
No resistance, no baggage, you know. I appreciate your point of view, right? <laughs> you all sorts of respect and stuff, as opposed to a Muslim who's like, you're... I can relate to that, they yeah. just say, right? Exactly. <laughs> they have that thing. And, and so all of that is easier. And even, even Yunus, alayhi salam, he left his people, like, it, it was, it's, it's difficult. And so when Nuh, alayhi salam, for 950 years, is speaking to an audience that is not responsive, and they're putting their fingers in their ears, and they're covering up, it shows you this incredible endurance and patience and perseverance that Nuh salam had. And it was, at the end of the day, it was because what causes a person to be able to do that is when you're actually not so concerned about the response of the people. Obviously, you want them to, res to respond positively, but your actions are being done not for them, they're being done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you recognize that Allah is your audience, and He's the one who appreciates it. And I like what you said in the post is that sometimes <clears throat> even though you may not think it's rewarding because you don't get that, that hype from it, that uh, dopamine yes. fix because you see you know, people are happy with you, listening to you. But if you go and, and give dawah to your daughter or to your son, the, they will be the most ungrateful. They don't, they're not going to thank you. And it's, going to be a difficult battle with them. Hmm. And this, this is really a serious matter because a lot of us forget our families and we spend more time uh, trying to fix other people's problems. And we have a lot of problems at home, but because it's harder to tackle your own problems at home and it's easier to solve other people's problems. Absolutely. Yeah. That's true. Absolutely. Also, other people listen to you. The point is, <laughs> you know something? I had an experience. In, I disagree with that. Uh, I know. I was just joking. No. Uh, I had an experience in Ireland. And until now, every time I think of that experience, I just think of no Hadith Salaam. Because he called them in private, in public, night, day. And the idea of plugging your ears and walking away from someone, that is so disrespectful and it's so difficult if that happens to you, you know? But we were giving street da'wah in Ireland and, and anyone who does not live in Ireland should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a thousand times and just go out and give street da'wah because I have never had an experience like that in my life. And I've given street da'wah in Australia and in, in South Africa and I've never experienced anything like that. First of all, like people just ignored you. You did not exist. You know, in America, <laughs> when someone's coming down the sidewalk, I start talking to him from right here. Even he's way down there. I start already prepping him and saying things to him and to try to pass out material. And even if they cannot stand me and if they're in a hurry, they just kind of smile and just, you know, like that. No, thank you. Amma fi Ireland. They, you don't exist. There's nobody standing there. They're just walking. You're talking to them, and you're talking, and you're talking, and, talking, and they just... <clears throat> do they make eye contact and ignore well, you? Well, you don't exist. No. no eye contact, nothing. You're not there. And they just... And it's not one or two. We stood there, I don't know, two hours. And then I met this old guy, and he was just telling me about... Uh, you know, back then, ISIS was big, and he was telling me Daesh and ISIS and all that. And I said, listen, man, don't you think if Islam told us to, to, to hurt non-Muslims, there would be a lot more murders in the, may, in, in the news and every day there would be a, a murder and I said, I've been Muslim my entire life, I've never once, once thought of killing anyone. He says, that's because you're not a good Muslim. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if you're a good Muslim, you would think about that all the time. Anyways, it was a really difficult experience and I was standing there just thinking of Nuh alayhi salam. It's not easy. And he is enduring, uh, two hours and I'm done. I'm like, I'm never going back. 950 is, years? The thing is, Nuh alayhi salam realized that, that these people, uh, you know, it's like he is always there. It's like if, if they open their door, he's probably inside their door, trying to give them da'wah. You know, all the message. Finally, he told them, In kana kabura alaykum maqami wa tafkiri. If it is too much for you that I am trying with you all this time. But if you think about it, it is. It is actually an act of love that Nuh alayhi salam did that. 100%. Because it doesn't matter. For 950 years and people are not really paying attention to him. You know how many people believed in him? They say around 12 people believed in him. 
Hmm. 12. About 12. And all this time, it's like he never gave up on them. Never gave up on them. And he will repeat it. And what happens after a while is that people, generations will die, and Nuh is still there, alayhi salam. And their children, they will tell their children, just like we heard, we heard in Surah Nuh, that stick to your God. Stick to the idols. Yaghut, Ya'uq, Nasr. Stick to them and do not listen to Nuh. There is a man from when they're babies, like two years, three years old, when they're able, able to speak, they will say, hey, son, by the way, there is a legend that we have here. His name is Nuh. And when you meet him, he's going to talk to you about not to worship the idols. Don't listen to him. All you need to do is just, it's easy. And it became like a, a, you know, a household training. Put your fingers in your ears and close your eyes. That's all you need to do. They raise their children on that. According to the Mufassirin, some say, they raise their children on that. It became part of their routine raising of their children. Don't listen to Nuh. Do not listen to him. Unbelievable. And they will die. The same thing will happen with the next generation. That's why finally Nuh السلام, had to make that dua. Mm. Oh Allah, do not leave any of them. Because these, these non-believers, if they continue, they will continue to mislead others. وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا كُبَّارًا Allah says mm. that they did a great treachery. You know, just the, or the numbers that you mentioned, just some perspective on these numbers. So Ibn Abbas, عنهمه, he says that Nuh had 80 followers with their wives and children. That's a number, an opinion, 80 followers. Which would mean every 11 years, one man follows him. And can you imagine? I don't, for, know, I don't huh? know where I got the 12 number. There is also, there is one yeah. closer to that. Ka'b al-Ahbar said that there were 72 men. Which means every 13 years, one person follows him. And then there is the opinion, close to what you said, there's an opinion that says he only had 10 followers believe in him. So every 95 years, can you imagine that? Every 95 years, one guy. And after almost 100 years passes, we got one guy. And so the reason I say that, so you have to understand when he makes the dua, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs him, no one else is going to believe. He now fears for the people who are with him. If, if it took me 95 years to get one guy, if we go with that number, and now no one else is going to believe, and I know that for sure, and they're going to yudillu ibadak, they're going to misguide your servants. La wallah, let them all drown, and let me preserve the 80 that I've got with me. It took me so long yeah, to get them. That's a good point. You know? <laughs> one of the, the things with regards to the story of Nuh is, is setting the scene, right? The context itself. So Nuh is the first messenger. Adam is the first prophet. Between them, how many generations do you think existed? How long did it take from Adam, father of humanity, who we've talked about before, and all of this shirk that existed that Nuh is combating for right. 950 years? How many generations do you think? Five? Five million? Have there been five million generations? What do y'all got? What numbers you got for me? Don't pay attention to the five million one. That'll screw your, your, your thinking. What do you got? Yasir, what do you got? 200? The hadith of 10 generations. It's the hadith. Yeah. Quran, yeah. But is that, that's between Adam and Between Adam and Nuh, there's Adam. 10 Quran. Al Qarn here is not yeah. 100 years. Al well, it could be, right? Is a generation. But according to the scholars, is that a generation, their generation, they used to live longer lives. Yeah. Like Nuh lived over a thousand, from what we understand. It could be 1,200. Uh, 1200 years that he lived something like if if you consider that he became a prophet at 300 some scholars say 300 he became a prophet yeah. 950 that was about 1200 1300 years or if you think it's 50 then it's a thousand years he lived so they but used did to everyone live, live that long so you could say there were thousands of years between Nuh alayhi salam and Adam so 10 generations after Ten generations, not of our generations, but of their generation. Yeah. 
according to the hadith. Jameel. Yes? What? So I wanted to use the language of generations just because it's the hadith. Qarn. Yes. So Ibn Abbas, he says that between the Prophet, between Adam السلام, and Nuh are 10. I'm translating them as generations just mm -hmm. because it's more, in my view, at least it's more precise. But then he tells the story of how Shaytan was able to get people to lead away to shirk. And he says that there were five righteous men. And these righteous men were Wud, and Suwa, and Yaguth, and Ya'uq, and, and Nasr. Where have you heard those names before? In Surah Nuh. These are actually the people who are being worshipped. So you're telling me that these righteous people ended up being worshipped? Yes. And that happens all the time. Can you give me an example? Jesus Christ, righteous man, worshipped? Yes. I said, uh, so what ended up happening? Shaytan came to these people after they were, after they died, these, these, these righteous men who were a pinnacle or who were exemplary in their righteousness. So people would be inspired by their righteousness. And then he said, why don't you create images of these five and they will inspire you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like they did. So you get a, a, a nice image of this person and and the people said, you know what, that's a good idea, but don't put them in the front of our musalla or our masjid. Put them all the way in the back. Just so that when we see them, we're inspired. But we don't want to put them in the front because we don't want to confuse our worship and all of that type of stuff. And so, great, they did that. They'd see it, they'd get inspired, they would go and they would pray Allah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, over time, those people passed away and then when their children and Ibn Abbas in particular he says and then knowledge became lost and that knowledge becoming lost is a really really crucial factor because every time knowledge is lost it becomes a door through which shaitan does his work of inviting people to shirk and inviting people to innovation and harm and so when those children grew up and they saw those images they said, what are these images for? They didn't know. And Shaytan came back to them and said, your forefathers used to worship them. And they were like, okay, bet. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good idea. And they began to worship him. And so you see, number one, how Shaytan really plays the long game when it comes to misleading. Right. Number two, you see the harm of the loss of knowledge. Literally every single generation that seeks knowledge becomes a protective force, not only for their generation, but for the next generation. And that's why it's so important that every generation seeks knowledge. You don't rely on just the knowledge of your parents or your grandparents or what have you. But that sabr is mind-blowing of, sh of shaitan. His dedication is just mind-blowing. Like he came, who came, he came to the first generation, then he comes to their grandchildren, right? That's what the narration says. So he waited hundreds of years, right? We're talking about a generation that lives maybe, I don't know, 500, 600 years. Maybe they live close to the, the, how long Nuh salam, lived. He waited hundreds of years, that just generation, to them. yeah, just waiting till the right time, no rush, and then he comes to them with that. That's, it's crafty, and it's, uh, it's like how Allah Azza wa Jalla says, لا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان, do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan. So the scholar said, the fact that he works in steps indicates that he's clever. Okay, he doesn't just come to you with a bad idea immediately, he gets you there gradually. I once heard a, a sheikh of mine mention, he said that the whispers of shaitan then become a metric that you can use. Because shaitan, because he only, t he, he only gives you, he only inspires you to sins within your radiance, he, uh, radius. He doesn't tell you long jumps. Like if a person is, you know, uh, a regular everyday Muslim, I guess, he's not going to come to them on day one and say, go kill a person. He's not going to come to them on day one and say, do drugs. They're not going to, he's not going to come to you with that. So just by looking at what the thing shaitan whispers to you, you can kind of get yourself to, to you can do a, a self-diagnosis of where your iman is. Because he only whispers to you things that are within your, your world. Yes, sir. I thought you had your hand raised. No? Okay. One of the things that I, I see is, is Allah's mercy with the people, that he is patient. If, 
you know, Allah is, is Al-Halim, Allah is Al-Sabur. He's patient with the people that he did not rush to punish them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to give people respite. So with the people of Nuh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was patient with them for, you know, a thousand years. And, and finally, because Allah knows everything, that he knew no one will, was going to be a believer after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Nuh the chance to make that dua for, for his people. But the, the punishment came after they had, like Nuh, exhausted everything. That's when the punishment came. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not rush to punish. And that's one of the, uh, one of the qualities of Allah, one of the names of Allah, Al-Halim, is that he does not rush to punish the people. And he gives them respite upon respite upon respite and gives them reminders upon reminders until they, and, and there, there are definitely certain uh, sins that are, you know, like rushed, that you rush the, the punishment for, but when it comes to accepting da'wah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them their, their chances. Amen. Yeah. Shaykh a person once asked me and he said, um, there's no evidence of the entire earth being flooded. Ooh. Well, how about we get to the flood eventually? Okay. Okay, because we, we're about to get to the flood. and I, That's interesting. I, I got a lot to say about that. I wanted to bef like kind of build up the story chronologically before we get to the flood. But not only was he patient for 950 years with these folks who don't listen and, and all that, but he's also enduring their yeah. insults and their accusations. So they said he's just a human being, which he should be, but that was their argument, which is a very bad and invalid argument that he should have been an angel. Like, why is he a human? He should have been a human. So they said that. They said that they accused him of being a madman. All right, and that's not easy. Everyone calling you the crazy person or what have you. They threatened to stone him. So there were threats also. We're going to stone you. And then they also claimed that he's misguided. And if you want to feel what that's like, like imagine you set up a da'wah table at your university and everyone just knows you as the crazy guy or the. <laughs> The misguided person, it's just, it angers yeah, And it you. happens, yeah. So it happens. Yeah. And he's do enduring that for a very long time. So that was, <laughs> that was one point. The other thing I want to comment upon real quickly. He said, uh, يَا قَوْمْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مَالَ إِنْ أَجْرِ إِلَّا عَلَى الله. He said, I don't ask you for any money. And so the scholar Ibn Sa'di made a comment. He said that, rahimahullah. He said that the being a da'ya or calling people to guidance or to Allah Azza that's the highest level. So, of course, in the context of a prophet here, not taking money, obviously, is the cleanest thing you can do. Because if you're taking money now, it doesn't look like you're doing it sincerely for Allah, you're doing it for the prophet. That's one. And two, when you take- Prophet with an F. Prophet with, a, with a, an IT, right? Or F, yeah, sahih. And, and not only that, but the, the minute you take money, then they dictate the message, you know. I know <laughs> one guy, he said he wanted to put together a YouTube channel. So he put it on his Facebook page. I want to put together a YouTube channel. Who wants to help me? He said, the FBI reached out to me. They said, we'll fund the whole thing. He said, la shukra, no thank you. You fund the whole thing, you're going to tell me which hadith is sahih and da'if from now on, which I had to use. <laughs> Forget about it. Did they message him on Facebook? I, that would be amazing. No, it was, I don't think it was on Facebook. I think they came to him. Oh, they knocked on his door? They, they, knocked, we they heard, banged on his door. You know? Like, we're here to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but, but so we built it up, right? We got to, to why Nuh made the dua. So we're getting close to the, yeah. to the flood. Okay. Uh, there are some, there's a story that you will find in every book of the stories of the prophets, but it's not authenticated whatsoever. But yeah, it's just mentioned that Nuh السلام, planted the trees first and waited a hundred years until the trees grew big and then cut them. And then we have all kinds of narrations, not a hadith, but like Israeliyat with the different dimensions of the width, height, and length of the ark. None of them are authentic. The point is that 
He, but what is authentic is that he did build it, and while he's building it, they pass by, and they... They said, are you, are you a carpenter now? Yeah, and they, <laughs> I can't help but laugh, because, you know, there was this, what's like, this iconic moment of this old stories of the prophet's cassette set, you know? And then uh, the speaker, you know, I think I'm going to give too many clues, but basically the speaker, when he got to this part, he was like, قَالُوا يَا نُوحِ سِرْتَ نَجَّارًا بَعْدَ أَنْ كُنْتَ نَبِيًّا So that, that clip, even though it's like 20 CD, 20 set, just that clip is what everyone remembers from it. So even that speaker's daughters and his sons, every time someone comes to them, hey, you know my favorite part of your dad's set? And they go, قَالُوا يَا نُوحِ So that's why I was laughing, I'm sorry. So could you just mention uh, Nuh's portrayal in the Bible? I um, think it, I, for those who give da'wah and interact with people, I think it's important that we are very clear with how the prophets are viewed in Islam versus how they're presented in the yeah. Torah. Yeah, so uh, as we learn together, first of all, uh, a prophet is not extreme, uh, extremely high or a very high position in Christianity. So when we use the term prophet, we explain to them that for us, and in reality, that's the highest level that a human being can attain is to become a prophet of Allah. So it's a big deal. And Nuh is also one of the five of the greatest prophets. So it's N-I-M-I-M, Nimim, right? Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, Muhammad, alayhim salatu wassalam. It's a cool little acronym you got there. Yes, sir. That's how we teach, right? <laughs> so what happens is the story, the part that stands out, of course, is the, this kind of very nasty story in the Bible concerning Nuh, alayhi salam. And uh, actually, that's, that's Lut with his daughters. This is Nuh, right? the, Nuh the, the drinking. getting drunk, and then he fell asleep drunk, and then he got the wind uncovered him. And then one of the brothers took a peek. Yani who takes a peek at his father? Billah alaykum. Yeah? He takes a peek. And then two other, he, then he tells them about the father. Come on. And then the other two brothers walk in backwards with a kind of like a sheet. And they cover their father's nakedness. Then when he wakes up, he curses the one that looked at him. And he, his face becomes black. And that's where all black people come from. That's the... <laughs> That's the uh, biblical yes. story. Your great I mean, grandfather it, it's was good a, to mention these things just to show the differences. But hey, you know, to find I, out that your great grandfather was a peeping tom, yeah. <laughs> disgrace. Um, you know, the reason why I mentioned it is actually I remember watching a lecture, a presentation by Yushua Evans, and he was talking about how, basically, how he became Muslim, and it was a very popular video. But one of the things that he mentioned was he said, like I just thought to myself the way that he was portrayed in the Bible, if there was a man in your town, in your city, who was known to get drunk to the point where he passes out. And then the next day he comes to you and says, I'm a messenger of God. Could those people be blamed for not believing him? Not at all. They're actually smart yeah. for not believing him. Right? right? Yeah, the town drunkard. Right. So if, I the wouldn't town, believe if the town drunkard is coming to you and says, I have a message from the heavens, right. you're not, I mean, no one, who's going to yeah. believe that? Right? And so that, that contradiction exists even in the portrayal of who Nuh alayhi salam was. It's a clear contradiction. Yeah. And that's why for us, alhamdulillah, we believe that the prophets, Allah says, وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ yeah. The prophets are free from every deficiency. They're free from every deficiency, right. including the deficiency yeah. of uh, you know, um, any sort of indecency that was attributed to them mm. by any people at any time. Speaking of which, did anybody watch the, uh, there's some movie came out some years ago. Yeah. I know a lot of Mashaikh went to watch Noah. that movie. Yeah. Uh, Noah? Was that, was that any good? I, Does anybody know? I didn't. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to, but that, okay. I, I always, I'm very reluctant to watch anything that portrays a prophet or a, a Sahabi, a famous Sahabi, because I don't want to have that image in my mind. Really? Are you against that? someone acting yeah. out the role of a Sahabi or a prophet? Uh, I, I, I can't answer. Okay. I, right. I, I used to be. I used anyway, to be so I, I have a, a note on, if you read in Surah Nuh, alayhi salam, you'll find water mentioned twice, right? And the first time it's mentioned, water or rain, is that it was a promise of blessing. 
when he says قُلْ تُسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا I said, Nuh is telling them, uh, seek forgiveness of your Lord, indeed Allah will forgive you. And he, 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 he's all-forgiving. يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا And he will send rain from the sky upon you in abundance. That first time rain was mentioned was in a form of a blessing. The same rain, when they rejected the message, came to them mm. in a form of a punishment. So it, it's amazing how it is the same rain. It's essentially the same rain, maybe a different intensity, but it's the same water. Mm. Water that would have come to you as a blessing, and water would have been as uh, a punishment. And that is actually mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that he, whenever he saw a dark uh, cloud, he would seek Allah's refuge from the evil of that, of that rain, if there is an evil, uh, you know, decreed in it. Mm -hmm. So subhanAllah, you see, it's the same water, right. but it is a blessing and it could be a punishment at the same time, depending on how you act towards the one who created for you. Are you thankful to Allah who gave you that water? Then it will become a blessing. Or are you not thankful? I mean, we saw Harvey, right? Yeah. And remember, Harvey came at the end of that month that had the solar eclipse. Yeah. If you remember that solar eclipse, we even prayed uh, the Khusuf prayer here at Click, and people had those eclipse glasses, whatever those things were called. Right. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And everybody was so excited. People, you know, People were so excited about seeing the eclipse. I remember Sheikh Wahid gave a khutbah and told everybody, like, calm down with the excitement. The Prophet ﷺ, when he would see an eclipse, he would be afraid. Yeah. And he would say, you know, uh, he said, when you see them, then pray. And you pray. The Prophet ﷺ would, if the wind changed, they could see the effects on his face. He, he would worry about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. And so the fact that we see these signs and we're just so mm -hmm. secure, we feel so secure from the punishment of Allah is, is, is uh, problematic. And we saw how just a few weeks later, this city was changed by Hurricane Harvey. I can't get over the one, the, one of the recent ones that was a, a big scare and everyone got ready for it. They bought food and water and everything. And we were expecting it and that's the one that swerved yeah. and went to Louisiana. Right. And I could not believe people being angry. Like, we, we got all this stuff for nothing. We got, like, you wanted it to hit? I went to Louisiana where it got hit. It was unbelievable. We went to this one area. This, this old man told us, you have to see it before you go back. And he told us how to get to it. And it's just basically this huge open space. And it's basically all the trees that fell down, they will mulch them and then dump the mulch there. And I'm not exaggerating, they were huge mountains, not hills, they were mountains of mulch. That's just from the down trees in one area. I'm like, people were upset that this didn't happen to them? That was crazy. Wow. <laughs> Sheikh, about that passage where Nuh salam says, Astaghfiru Rabbakum, that's a beautiful passage, mm -hmm. where he says, seek forgiveness from your Lord. And Nuh tells his people, by seeking forgiveness, a number of things is gonna happen. Yeah. But even before we go there, I just wanna give an example. The, the example of Al-Hasan al-Basri. Al-Hasan al-Basri is the master preacher of the Tabi'een from Basra, from Iraq. And a man came to him and he said to him, I don't have the ability to conceive. Me and my wife, we haven't conceived. We haven't had children. And so Al-Hasan al-Basri told me, he said, go and make istighfar. And then another man came and said, I don't have money. Came to me and he complained about poverty. And so he said to him, go and make istighfar. Seek Allah's forgiveness. Another person came, he was a farmer, and he complained of drought. And then Hassan told him, he said, go and seek forgiveness. And so now the people who are around him, they see three different scenarios coming to him. And he gave the same prescription to every single one. So they asked him about that. We're telling everybody to seek forgiveness. And then he said to them, did you not hear what Nuh salam said to his people? Seek forgiveness from your Lord. Innahu kana ghaffara. He is oft forgiving. What will happen? He will make the, the rain cascade upon you. 
وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالِ وَبَنِينَ And he will grant you wealth and children وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ And he will make for you gardens and he will make for you rivers. If you seek Allah's forgiveness, you will have children. If you seek Allah's forgiveness, you will have wealth. If you seek Allah's forgiveness, you will have rain. All from the story of, 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 of Nuh alayhi salam. Hmm. And so I remember one of my friends, he, he was one of the earliest of us to get married. Like really early. And I don't think anybody was expecting it to be him. So when we were at his wedding, everybody's like, like so how did, how did this happen? Because we didn't expect... Was he ugly or something? No, I'm just saying. <laughs> no comment. He wasn't ugly. <laughs> I'm kidding. But I mean... But you were better looking. I'm just saying, I was there. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay. So in any case, everybody's asking him. It's a blessing, man. Everybody's no. asking him. Everybody's asking him, like, how did you make this happen? And he said, if I can tell you something, it's istighfar. That's it. He wow. said, I was just making a lot of istighfar, especially, he said, in the sahar time, in the morning before Fajr. So I remember mentioning this in a lecture a year ago or two years ago uh, in another city and I got a, a message a couple weeks later, sister who had attended, she was like, I made a lot of istighfar after your lecture. <laughs> she said, I just want to let you know, alhamdulillah, I got engaged. I was like, oh, mashallah. And so for those who are still looking for jobs, just graduated, istighfar. For those who are looking yeah. for spouses and for offspring, make istighfar. Allah what is, Allah what Allah is istighfar again? Seeking Allah's forgiveness. You seek Allah's forgiveness. Seeking yes. Allah's forgiveness. You know something? We have some, يعني, for lack of a better term, we have th some things that work like magic. But you just have to put the effort. Right. You know? Exactly. Like in my travels, so many people would come and say, I've been trying to find a job. And I'd tell them, listen, make istighfar. Make a career out of istighfar. They wouldn't do it. But I remember one guy came to me, you know, and you're just a traveling guy. What, what am I going to do for you? Except give you some kind of nasiha. So he said, uh, you know, I can't find a job. I said, listen, make a career out of istighfar. Mm, this that's your job. Yeah. Make a this career. is, that's a this good is one. the guy. Yeah. <laughs> this is the guy that sent me an email. Actually, no, I came back to that same masjid, same city, like, I don't know, a year later or months later. He said, I made istighfar like a champ. Two weeks later, I got a job. <laughs> Whereas before, he's like, over a year, he can't get a job. Yeah. But it's like, when you take it seriously, yeah. amazing things happen. And there are stories in our times, and I know multiple stories, not just of different couples. Well, you got to give us one. Uh, it's just basically the story of a couple that uh, they were trying to conceive, and they went to Italy, and they went overseas, nothing. And then a sheikh told them, make istighfar. And the guy said, I'll make as much istighfar while I'm at work as I could. My wife, Baga, she was at home, as all she did was istighfar. He said... In weeks, she was pregnant. But that also Allah. requires sincerity in your istighfar. You're Absolutely. not making istighfar to test, so you can get the reward. Yeah, salam, and you're not testing Allah, oh, let's see if this yeah. works or not. You're sincerely. And that's why you just reminded me to f mention the last verse in that sequence. You know, Ali salam, after telling him, Allah will do this and Allah will do this and Allah will do this, he says, Ma lakum la tarjuna lillahi wa qara. It's amazing. He says, yeah. why don't you give respect Allah his due respect? His due respect. Like, it's Allah. Allah. You're talking to this imam, and if someone told you, you know, there's this doctor in this place, you would go, and if someone told you that this person is hiring, you'd go and wait outside of his door. You would do all of these things to get what you want. And he says, why don't you give Allah Yeah, and that's, his... That's a great point, actually. I'm sorry to interrupt. Problem. You know, I, I just... Uh, there was someone who was saying, I mean, one of my shiuch actually uh, put a post and says that... Uh, this country is, is protected by the, the number of saints that are buried there. He's saying that. And astaghfirullah, this is someone who's saying that about one country because of the number of saints. I mean, what is the difference between idol worship and thinking that way? Mm. Yeah. And actually, malakum la tarjun lillahi wa qara. Why don't you give Allah the credit for the protection of your house? Your house is not protected because of some saint. Your house is not protected because of some uh, person or uh, jinn or whatever it is that you hold respectful. But your house, your home, your country is protected by the decree of Allah, by the blessings of Allah, by the mercy of Allah, by Allah himself. 
So this is important. The story of Nuh gives us that actually because that's what they did. That's their message. Yeah. And Allah ma yeah, min ilahin ghayru. Right. Worship Allah. All of the prophets are always telling everybody, worship Allah. You have no deity other than Him. It's consistent throughout the Quran. Nuh, in many places, you find him saying, worship Allah, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And to the Shaykh's point, Shaykh Ibrahim's point is that when you see how the Prophet وسلم, himself as the culmination of all of these messages, you see him protecting the ummah from this type of thought. Yeah. And so a person comes to Rasulullah and says, Masha Allah wa shi'at, whatever Allah wills and you. And the Prophet وسلم, says, Did you make me a partner to Allah? No, rather say, Whoever what Allah wishes alone. Masha Allah wahda, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will alone. Mm -hmm. And there's so much of how the Prophet Sallallahu sought to create distance between Allah and everybody else, including himself. Nice. And we, we could fall in this, unfortunately, uh, in, in different ways, without, sometimes, hopefully unintentionally. Sometimes we put so much reliance on a person. You know, I, hear, I heard one uh, motivational speaker saying, that equip yourself with positive people because they'll change your life. Your life will be different if you surround yourself with positive people. And I say, can't you just give Allah the credit? Mm. Yeah. Give Allah the credit. Even if you're surrounded by negative people, maybe Allah puts you there so you can change them because Allah wants to change them through you. So give Allah the credit. That's Malakum la tarjuna lillahi waqara. Again, why don't you give Allah his due respect? Allah, I kubar, Allah, I kubar. Allah, Allah, I kubar, Allah, I kubar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول Are there, you're asking if there are different uh, versions of istighfar. So you can say astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions Sayyid al-istighfar, a lengthy version of istighfar. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa anta khalaqtani wa anabduka wa ala ahdika wa atika wa sata'at. Like there are different versions of istighfar. I would refer a person to look at, um, if they want to look, there's Husn al-Muslim, the fortress of the Muslim, that booklet. It has a lot of different versions. No, no, the, the default is istighfar lil-dhunub. If you want your, your sins to be forgiven. That's it. Yaqub. Those are the fruits yeah. of istighfar, yeah. 
I mean, I don't want to repeat this story too much, but uh, I said it. Uh, there was a khutbah about istighfar. We mentioned the story where uh, the guy heard the a lecture where the sheikh is saying, telling success stories of people who made istighfar a thousand times a day, a thousand five hundred times. He said, I started doing it a thousand times a day. Nothing happened. I upped it to a thousand five hundred times a day. For six months, nothing happened. He said, then Qadr Allah, the sheikh came back to the city, the one I heard the lecture from. He said, I went to him. He said, the sheikh asked me a question and I immediately figured out what I was doing wrong. He said, the sheikh said, I, were you making istighfar, testing to see if things will change and your finances will work out or you get married? Or were you sincerely asking Allah to forgive your sins? He said, the minute he said that, I understood. He said, and I started making istighfar, sincerely asking Allah to forgive my sins. He said, now if you ask me about every aspect of my life, financial, excellent, marital, excellent. Everything is going well. MashaAllah. You know? Inshallah. Now, Shaykh, we got a few minutes to get to the flood. Let's do it. Let's make it rain. So, so look, what's interesting, okay, so now we know why the flood's going to happen. And uh, Nuh alayhi salam is building the ark, and while he's building it, they're coming and they're telling him, Ya Nuh, and they're making uh, fun of him and so on. Then, uh, so. He puts the animals on it. And there is some Israeliyat that says the wild beasts were in the first, uh, the lower level. What, what is an Israeliyat? Israeliyat are basically Judeo Christian narrations. Not, doesn't mean today's Bible. It means they were brought into Islam a long time ago by uh, scholars, Jewish scholars, and who became companions and became Muslim and so on. And they brought with them some of these. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hadithu an Bani Israel wa Haraj. He said, You can relate from the stories of Bani Israel and there's no harm unless they go against what's in the Quran. So we take them at face value. So it says that the bottom level was wild animals, the middle was people, and then the third level was uh, birds. But the point is basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Nuh to take his family, his followers, and the, the, the animals, and gave him a sign and the sign is something where he said tanur is the oven and if water comes out of the oven so this is a place where you would not expect and water came from up and down so it sprung out of the ground and it rained heavily like so severely. what is the oven here somebody's like what is this oven that's being discussed so right he's now? in his house and, and when is what's the sign to go so well, if you see water coming out of the oven that's how some scholars explained it so he's in his home and he sees now water coming out of a place where there's never water. The oven is, you keep it dry, you keep a fire there. Now water's coming out of that place, which is not natural. That's your sign, get out. So he calls his people, his, fo his followers, they get on the, the big boat and they go. And the waves are gigantic. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes waves like the mountains. Al -jibal. Al -jibal. Right. So what? <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the conversation between Nuh and his son. Mm. And that is actually, yeah, I was reading it at one time. And I couldn't, it, it just, I stopped at it while I was reading it in the prayer. And it was so profound. It, and the, it being profound is because Allah is talking about it in the Quran. He is, no one ever was able to see that conversation or listen to that conversation except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah is telling us this and he says uh, when the ark is moving with them in a, in a huge wave like a mountain or like mountains so it's like consecutive um, waves like mountains وَنَادَى نُوحٌ إِبْنَهُ So now Nuh is crying out to his son. نَادَى نُوحٌ إِبْنَهُ Now the thing is, according to Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, when he commented on this ayah, when Allah told him, do not ask what you don't know, is that, wallahu alam, only Allah knows, that Nuh all the time thought that his son was Muslim. One of, uh, he has four sons. Three of them were Muslim, definitely. But one of them, he didn't know, Kanaan, I think, he didn't know. 
he thought the whole time he was Muslim. He was uh, going along with him. Mm. He was one of his family. So now, three of his sons are with him, except this one. So he cried out from the, the boat and the, and, and, and the waves. And he says, وَنَادَ نُوحٌ ابْنَهُ وَكَانَ فِي مَعْزِلٍ His son was trying to stay away. يَا بُنَيَّ ارْكَمْ مَعَنَا My son, يَا بُنَيَّ And he didn't say, يَا ابْنِي He used a very endearing word. يَا بُنَيَّ Oh, my dear son, come and ride with us. يَا بُنَيَّ ارْكَمْ مَعَنَا وَلَا تَكُنْ مَعَ الْكَافِرِينَ And do not be with the non-believers. Be with us and don't be with the non-believers. Sometimes that point can really differentiate between who is with you and who is not with you. Hmm. He said, I will resort to a mountain that will protect me from the water. Hmm. Nuh told him, there is no protection except with Allah. He says, there is no protection except with Allah. قَالَ لَا عَاصِمَ الْيَوْمَ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ there's no protection today from this except with Allah Himself, except whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy. Now his son drowned, and Nuh is in a great turmoil, great sadness. So he knows it's time for me to talk to my Lord and ask Him, because He promised me my family. He promised me my family will be safe. So he asked Him, and this وَنَادَ نُوحُ الرَّبَّ Now he's crying out to Allah. فَقَالَ رَبِّي إِنَّ ابْنِي مِنْ أَهْلِي وَإِنَّ وَعْدَكَ الْحَقُّ Oh my Lord, my son is from my family. And your promise is true. وَأَنْتَ أَحْكَمُ الْحَاكِمِينَ And now he said, I am not like suggesting, you're the all wise. He says, oh Nuh, he's not from your family that were promised. Yes, he is from your family, but not from the family that were promised to be saved. Now, the, what really impressed me is the, the, the father feeling for his child, for, for him to cry out that way. The father's feeling toward his child, to cry out that way. And the second thing is that he asks Allah, why, why did my son have to go? Why did my son have to go? Nuh did not know that his son was not a believer at all. So this was like troubling when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, you don't know, don't ask what you don't know, what you don't have a knowledge of. Now some people say, we ask Allah when we don't know, but that is not what we, what's meant by it. It's meant What's well, meant by that you thought he was a believer and he was supposed to be saved, but he's not a believer and he was not included in the promise. And I will leave the next point for the brothers here. Go for it. You know, just uh, quickly, next week, inshallah ta'ala, on this topic of Nuh and his son, next week our topic is going to be about fathers, inshallah ta'ala. Father's Day is going to be next uh, weekend. Mm. And I think. Something interesting to me is the way that fathers are presented in the Quran and the language that they use with their children, with their sons. So Shaykh Ibrahim just indicated that beautiful phrase, Ya Bunay, O my beloved son. That's the way that the fathers talk in the Quran. And so you take Nuh alayhi salam and the way that he talks to his son. And then you look at Yaqub alayhi salam and the way that he talks to Yusuf. He says, Ya Bunay, la taqsus ru'yatik ala do not give or tell your story to your brothers. But he uses the word bunay. He uses that same endearing term. And then you have Luqman alayhi salam talking to his son. And he says, Ya bunay, ya la tushrik billah. Do not commit shirk with Allah. Again, it's a, the only time to my quick like, knowledge that you will find a father addressing his son by his name is Anta raghibun an. That's Azar. A non believer. The non believer talking. And then Ibrahim is still talking to his father in an endearing way. Yeah, yeah, yeah Abati. Yeah, like, 
so, so, so I look forward to just right. kind of looking at these, inshallah ta'ala, next week when we talk about fathers. Nice. All right. So, back to that question you asked, which is a good question. There's no evidence, hmm. Mr. Religious Person here, <laughs> right? We're in a college classroom or a high school classroom, and someone says to them, there's no evidence that the entire world was flooded. Yeah. This is fake news. <laughs> I'm so not, what do you have? I'm liking the accent. But so. unfortunately, the person they're talking to in high school is a young Kamal al-Makki. Mm. Barbecue chicken. They're in for it. So, okay, you know, because this issue, this is a big issue for Christians, by the way. You know, even when we sit down with them and we have talks, they always bring up archaeological evidence. Like, we have archaeological evidence that Jesus existed. You know why you need archaeological evidence? Because your book is <laughs> zero. And your book is not reliable. So you need to go f dig up stuff. We don't have that issue. But I always tell them that we don't need to find the skeleton of a whale at the top of Mount Everest to say, oh, this is proof that one day the water was this high. And Did then they when really the water. Find the skeleton of no, they oh, haven't. Okay. okay. Uh, the water receded and this whale got stuck. And that's why. We, you know why? I always tell them the same thing. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cleans up, He cleans up good. That's why. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the moon to split like this, and it split like this, not like this, it split like this, and He put it back together, He put it back together very mm -hmm. nicely. Unlike when you broke your, your mother's favorite vase and you glued it up and she came and there was light coming through it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala glues things back clean. So that's why you don't have to find fossils of fish at the top of a mountain or a whale in the desert or a crack on the moon. <laughs> I always say this, that just, just Google crack on the moon. And every result will be Muslim websites, Muslim videos on YouTube saying there's a, a you know, when the astronauts came, they found a crack on the moon, a fissure. We have uh, Sheikh Yasser Burjas, he actually called NASA. And we're just a few, we're just down the road from NASA. He called NASA. They said, he said, did you find any crack on the moon? They said, no, all the crack is in New York. There's n <laughs> You're waiting for that. <laughs> there is no, there's no crack on the moon. You know why? Allah will glue it nicely. So that's the first thing I always tell people. I don't have to find the staff of Musa to prove Musa existed. I don't need to find evidence of fish in the desert to say, oh yeah, this is the flood. But, um, but the question really is, is was the flood uh, worldwide or was it regional? It was actually, so I think one of the, the, the things that we always have to pay attention to when we're talking to Christians or uh, anybody who believes in the Judeo-Christian sources is that Muslims, we don't have the liabilities that the biblical text carry. The Quran doesn't say that the entire earth was flooded. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Quran doesn't say that. It's local. The Bible does actually. The Bible does. Yeah. But we as Muslims, we don't have to take the liabilities of the Bible. That's the point. Right. That's a very good point. Yeah. And so it's, it's very important because sometimes Muslims kind of just assume, you know, and, and I'll even have Muslims who come and say, well, there, there's this Muslim. Sometimes you'll have non-Muslims come and say, there's a Muslim person in my classroom who's saying that the that entire world was flooded. It's like, so which one do you believe? It's very important that we go back to our source and we pay attention to what our tradition says and that we be literate in our tradition so that we don't necessarily have to compromise on things that our Islam never mentions in the first place. Yes? Why would he take all of the animals with okay. him? Okay. Jamil. I mean, that even the animals, it, it doesn't have to be all the animals. It could be that the animals that they needed for their livelihood at that point. My, my so, first question would be, what's the, even the, the authenticity of that narration in the first place? Like, that's the first part. If, if, it's, hmm. if it's a highly authentic hadith, if it's, then, okay, then we enter into these. But I'm, I don't even know if it's authentic, that hadith. I don't know. So, I don't know, Allah, I don't remember. But what I do know is this. First of all, the scholars did differ. Some scholars, Muslim scholars, actually believe that it was a, a worldwide flood. Others believe it was regional, all right? 
And they say, they argue that the apparent meaning of the Qur'an indicates that it was worldwide. But that's the apparent meaning. They said, uh, Anything that, uh, the Tufan was the, the flood, but, but it refers to anything that overpowers and spreads like far and wide. But they said, in Surah Al-A'raf, the people of Fir'aun got a Tufan. And it was regional. It doesn't have to be worldwide. Then we have uh, uh, Ibn Atiyah, rahimahullah, he says that there is no evidence that it was worldwide. And then there's some good arguments, all right? We just brought up one good argument. Now, if it was worldwide, yeah, and you tell me Nuh went to Australia and brought koalas, a male and female koala, a wallaby, a Tasmanian no. devil, uh, a dingo. Most yeah, likely it's the local animal type. that they have. Aywa, so if it's local, then he took two of the local animals, which would be the, the typical things. I, and then they are also argued, type, why would Allah destroy everyone else in the rest of the world? They did not disobey Nuh. Yani if you want to argue, مثلا, that there were people in Africa, why would Allah destroy them? They did not disobey Nuh. They never met Nuh. So there, that's another argument they're making. Mm -hmm. I honestly believe that, okay, that Wallahu ta'ala a'lam, yani, and, and the first thing that's important to mention here is that when we discuss things like this, we just very lightly mention what we probably think happened, but you don't get all rigid and gung-ho about your point of view, because you don't really have evidence, like you have anecdotal evidence, and the other person has anecdotal evidence, you don't have any hard and fast evidence, so, so don't be too rigid on things like this, yeah. but I quickly want to say that the, the reason I would like to believe that it was regional also is that this was not that many generations away from Adam salam, and it is very probable that people for the most part stayed within that region. If they spread out, they spread out this way or that way, but they did not cross uh, any rivers, I mean, yeah, any large bodies of water. And there is, again, it's Perhaps also slightly anecdotal evidence, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let me look at these verses here. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we carried their offspring on this loaded ark or this ark. Then it says, Some scholars said this verse, and we created for them, similar to it, that they ride upon. Yani, we created similar boats and ships and vessels from that point on that they would ride upon. So some scholars said this verse is proof that this was the first boat or ship. Prototype. A anyway, prototype. And after that, people... So that's why it does not lead me to believe that people crossed the oceans and made it far and they more or less stayed within that region. Wallahu ta'ala ala. I don't have any strong evidence to say Back either or. Beautiful. So we're at 10 p.m. Inshallah Ta'ala. We want to give Sheikh Ibrahim the last word before we wrap up. But I just want to say, again, Inshallah Ta'ala, next week we'll be continuing with the topic of fathers, Inshallah. And then uh, I think we need to do a, a, a social afterwards. We had chai versus chai, and then we never did anything after that. Yalla, give us ideas. Who's got ideas? We thought of a bake-off. It just seems doable. What else is there? Is a bake-off easy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yasir, do you, do you bake? You do? Oh, I thought you just wanted to eat. You bake, huh? Bake off. Yeah, you, no, no, no it's sale. Not a bake sale. You bake. You bring and, and you judges. bake, and then it gets voted, and then whoever's baked goods are the best become the champion of Clear Lake Islamic Center, and everybody respects them. And until a month later, they forget. Until yeah, exactly. Who was our chai champion? Anyone remember? I know who the real champ was. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I don't remember. I remember it was, a, it, was a, it was the Adeni tea. Yeah, made by the Jordanian brother, right? Yeah, Wasn't yeah, that yeah. <laughs> the Jordanian who made Yemeni tea? Khalas khair, inshallah. So with that, there is, uh, there is a statement by Imam Malik, uh, rahimahullah, that whoever sticks to the sunnah of the Prophet, uh, sticks to the Ark of Noah. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the Ark of Noah. He said the Sunnah the is like the Ark of Noah. Yeah, the Sunnah is the Ark of Noah. Whoever, whoever sticks to it is saved. Whoever rode the Ark of Noah was saved. 
and whoever follows the sunnah will be saved. Whoever stays away from the sunnah of the Prophet, the way of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and essentially the way of all the Prophets, uh, well, all the Prophets of their time, whoever followed their sunnah and followed their ways, they are actually, they rode the Ark of Noah, thereby were saved, and whoever don't will not be saved, they will drown. And the metaphor of it is that the sunnah gives you clarity. And following other than sunnah will be drowning you in confusion. You'll be drowning in confusion and misguidance. Zat I also, Allah, just yeah. one last thing. This is um, a historical Friday Night Lights, alhamdulillah. So in case anybody wants to write it in their journal, today the date is uh, June 10th. 2022, I think this is the first official Friday Night Lights where the brothers were more than the sisters. Takbir. Allahu Akbar. That, that is a good observation. It is a good observation. Yeah. Everybody kind of just bashes the I think we should brothers. thank Brother Sheikh Kamal Sheikh for this. Kamal for this today. <laughs> because of his khutbah? <laughs> <laughs> because of the khutbah, nobody wants to come to the masjid, huh? His all khutbah right. shahed away all the sisters. They ran, you ran them all away. No, no, alhamdulillah. Don't worry, I'm sure next week they'll be back with a vengeance, inshallah. Zakun Lakhay guys, so watch the Hamadaza.